we'll transition over there. Um, I will, I'll pass you the presenter and feel free to accept it whenever, whenever works for you. Um, so I guess just before we begin, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Caitlin Rose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Prairie Conservation Action Plan. And PCAP has a monthly native prairie speaker series about anything to do with prairie conservation or species at risk. And the last couple of years, we've been fortunate enough to join SODCAP at their AGM and host one of our speaker series there. And um, even though with COVID going on, we're really excited we're able to do that again this year. Um, this presentation is about badgers, and I'm personally very, very excited about it. Um, Diana, Diana and I have been in touch for um, probably about nine months working on getting this going, so I'm glad that we're, we're here. <laughs> um, so just before we begin, I've got a short bio about Diana that I'd like to introduce. So Diana Gikas grew up in southern Quebec and moved west when she was 24 years old. And she completed eight years of post-secondary education in biological sciences. Her studies focused on wildlife population ecology, and her fieldwork concentrated on large carnivores. Diana worked for Parks Canada, Banff, Kootenai, Yoho National Parks for 10 years, and she has been with the Canadian Wildlife Service located in Regina for the past 15 years. Presently, she works on conservation and recovery planning for the CWS Prairie Region for mammal species at risk, such as ba badgers, bats, grizzly bear, and Oh, sorry, can you hear me okay? Now I can. Ah, okay. Um, did, I'm not sure when I tuned out there, but uh, did you hear your introduction or should I do it again? <laughs> no, we're good. Thank you. Um, did you hear it okay? Or no? I heard most of it. I'll, I'll just, you heard most of it? Okay. Uh, we got a few people. Oh, lost after a grizzly bear. So sorry, I must have muted myself. Um, so Diana has i um, been working conservation recovery planning for the CWS Prairie Region for mammal species at risk, such as badgers, bats, grizzly bear, and wolverine. Um, so with that, I will turn my camera off and mute myself and pass it over to you, Diana. Thanks, Caitlin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm wondering if you're ready for a break or how your day is going, but um, just a little bit of uh, background for me. I, I was working on the Badger file for a couple of years, but then I've been, um, for the past year, I've been working on grizzly bears. So uh, the Badger file has been put on temporarily on hold. Um, anyhow, I'm going to start. We'll go ahead. Not for any reason other than uh, we're just short on resources. So I'm I'm focused on grizzly bear right now. Um, okay, so this is a picture of me in my winter gear. And uh, I had an excellent two years of field work in the south of the divide. It was wonderful. And so even though you can't see the smile, um, there is a smile there. It was a great experience. So today I'm going to provide a bit of a background. Uh, I'm going to talk about the knowledge that we're trying to compile. Uh, we're a little bit data deficient for, uh, I shouldn't use that word, but <laughs> we're uh, lacking some information for badgers on the prairies. Um, so I'll talk about our initial steps and our preliminary insights, and then I'll, I'll move on to some thoughts about conservation. So in Canada, there's um, actually three subspecies. So there's one uh, subspecies that's in um, BC and one in uh, southern Ontario, and these are both um, endangered uh, populations. So very small population size and, uh, and geographically iso and genetically isolated too as well. And then in the middle, we have the taxis um, of species, and that's uh, been listed uh, on Kosiwik as special concern. That just happened a couple of years ago. And, um, and species that are um, listed with, under SARA as uh, special concern uh, do not have any prohibitions that apply to them. So uh, Kosiwik uh, recommended a special concern status 
um, it was accepted and listed on SARA, but there are no prohibitions, so no critical habitat uh, needs to be identified. So species of special concern, it's more like a caution sign, just saying we need to be careful so we don't uh, bump the species up to a higher risk level. So there has been um, some substantial genetic studies that have been done, uh, researchers in southern Ontario, um, and what they have found is that the genetics um, support the three subspecies categories. Previously, those subspecies had been based mostly on morphology, skull morphology, color of the fur, and things like that. But the genetics are supporting those three subspecies, but they also found um, some distinct genetic groups within those subspecies. So uh, Kosiewicz identified uh, two genetic groups in uh, BC. Um, but what I think is, is interesting for us is that they found that the Alberta and Saskatchewan badgers were more similar uh, than they were to Manitoba. And that Manitoba is actually more similar to northern Michigan. So we're not sure why that is. Is it an artifact of the type of genetic work that was used? They used mitochondrial DNA, so it's possibly an artifact of, of the genetics. But it, or is there something that's really uh, blocking um, movement, such perhaps there's unsuitable habitat um, or that kind of thing that's um, maybe um, isolating these, those two groups. But what's interesting is that Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Montana all have similar genetics. So some question marks around that. So about badgers, they're pretty small in size. Females are slightly um, smaller than males. Um, they mate during the summertime. They have delayed implantation. And uh, that's common in um, weasels and actually bears as well. So um, it's sort of a strategy. So if they don't put on enough fat, um, they can uh, reabsorb, um, I don't know the exact whether it's the egg or the embryo, but they reabsorb it and then um, they don't have to raise young if they're too thin. So they have six weeks gestation. The birthing period is in the spring. Average litter size is two to four. Juvenile dispersal, they're pretty young, three to four months. Um, adult females don't always reproduce yearly for the reasons I, part of the reasons I just explained. And then um, their longevity is highly variable. So there have been records, they, they think four to six years in the wild, so there have been some older animals as well, and of course, um, some stuff younger. Uh, more about badgers. So they're, they have a wide diet breadth, so it really depends on what's available, what prey are available. And so they will pretty much uh, almost eat anything they can, they can manage to kill. Um, <clears throat> they're quite small. Close, close to the ground, so their biting power is pretty limited. Um, they also cache their food, which is really neat. So Gail Michener, I'm sure some of you know about her. She was mon um, studying uh, Richardson ground squirrels in, around Lethbridge for many years, 10 to 15 years. And um, so she found that actually the badgers were um, killing hibernating uh, ground squirrels and then Hashing them in, a, in order and then retrieving them in the same order, and generally they were consumed within one to 55 days. And so she called that fall fattening. And I liken it to bears when they're fattening up on berries in the fall time or salmon or whatever. Um, they're just trying to put on some fat before winter. So this is a neat, actually, first of all, I'll mention this is um, Gail's um, study where she looked at um, caching ground squirrels. So she sort of did a flow chart and how many were buried above ground and below ground and um, how far away they were from the kill site. And then this is another, this is really interesting. I don't know how many people have heard about this, but it was in Utah. They were having a um, study where they were looking at scavengers and they put out um, carcasses, uh, cow, calf carcasses. And they found, um, so they put out, I think, four carcasses. And then they had um, cameras at each carcass. And they discovered that two badgers actually could bury 
the complete uh, cow uh, carcass. I mean, so they their excavating abilities are quite good. Uh, and similar to Gail's work, they um, they only uh, sat on the carcass for uh, up to I think it was two weeks actually in this case. So an interesting fact is that um, single badgers and single coyotes sometimes travel and hunt together. And Paul Paquette and um, other uh, researchers noticed this about 30 years ago. They, they published a, just an account of it in uh, Cypress Hills, and that was in the Canadian Field Naturalist. And I'll just see if we can get this video going. Let's show this is in California. And it's a culvert that goes under a highway. They were, man they were monitoring. Um, we'll just play that again so you can just see the coyote's behavior with the badger. And they actually had documented other um, video of it as well. Key to finding habitat features. So the, uh, the Committee on the uh, Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, their 2012 report, so it's eight years old, obviously, but um, they defined the key habitat features as um, prey, so the number and, and availability of prey, soil types, so they want you want coherent soil that won't collapse, and uh, they, they apparently seem to avoid clay soils. Um, and then grassland and shrubland. So based on work that's been done in southern BC and southern Ontario for the endangered um, badgers, they avoid cultivated fields. Uh, they go into agricultural areas only if there's sufficient um, cover. So field edges, hedgerows, that kind of thing. They are found in wetlands, alpine areas, and even open forests like in BC um, if it's prey supported. So apparently they're nocturnal, um, but that seems a bit questionable. Um, a lot of the, the camera records we have for, no, I wouldn't say a lot, but many of camera records we have for um, Grasslands National Park is showing daytime activity. They have intermittent periods of torpor, so their metabolic rate decreases, the body temperature goes down. and um, but it's highly variable. So for some badgers, it can be a few days, and for others, it can be up to you know, 20 or 30 days. Only one study has looked at this, um, and that was at the very northern range in BC, uh, in the Caribou uh, Mountains. And, uh, and what he found was that um, temperature and snow depths weren't the trigger. It was actually a progression in uh, winter progression, so the number of days since they, they went into the borough, suggesting that it's about um, fat levels and, and what the reserves are like. And then also their travel distances are highly variable. So I don't, I don't tend to talk about home range size much or, because it really depends on uh, the amount of prey that they're is available to them and whether it's just, there's so many variables, whether they're searching for a mate, uh, the habitat quality and so on. So this winter ecology study in uh, the Caribou uh, Mountains, um, they found that there was a distinct different burrows. So they called, uh, they have winter burrows, natal burrows, which are in the spring and summer burrows. So they found the number of entrances, which makes sense, were highest for the natal burrows, um, and the fan size was also highest for the winter in the natal burrows and smallest for the summer burrows. So this can help um, if it applies in the prairies, we don't know, but it could help if um, some kind of you know industry and consulting companies are trying to monitor those burrows. So our state of knowledge for prairie badgers is quite limited. Um, Gail Mitchner and Gilbert Prue have done some research. We really, uh, we don't know the size of the population and, um, and that's identified in the COSIWIC status report. They acknowledge that we, we don't know the size of the population. Um, we have one status report from Alberta 
but uh, very little uh, that I, I'm aware of elsewhere uh, on the prairies. So we don't, we don't know about their mortality rates. We don't know about their re reproductive rates. We don't know about um, the food abundance and distribution. That's a tough one to, to monitor. And we don't know about soil and habitat associations and constraints. We have a number of observation records which are available through um, CDCs. So in Alberta, it's the Fish and Wildlife Management Information System. And, and a lot of those observations are from industry and consulting companies doing surveys. And then in Saskatchewan, we have nature staff because actually the landowners have been reporting on their um, badger uh, sightings uh, to the quarter section level. And they've actually been doing that for a number of years. Um, because of the public insurance we have for vehicles, uh, we were able to get uh, mortality records actually for, uh, from SGI and from um, Manitoba uh, public insurance, and that's been really helpful. Uh, iNaturalist is another, uh, they have a few observations, and Manitoba CDC hadn't been collecting um, data, but they are now, and it's just because of their protocols for um, element occurrence. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take this data and we're going to map the extent and the distribution of the observations, and we'll use that for mortality as well. And if we have enough reproductive data, we can we can map that as well, sort of like dense sites. Um, this is kind of interesting. This is a bit of a pet project of mine. Um, the Hudson Bay Company archive actually back her returns go back to the 1700s, and um, so I'm trying to look at if verifying the historical range extent, so how far north, that's really the question mark, is how far north did they go? And we're doing this for a number of species at risk, for grizzly bear, uh, swift fox, um, badger, wolverine. And then as, as well, the provincial data, uh, they, there's a number of uh, records available from the fur return, so we can look at the current um, range extent. So now just sort of for fun, I'm going to show you a few records from the Hudson Bay Company um, Swan River District. And I just want to go back. So this blue arrow is pointing to um, the Swan River and the Saskatchewan districts, and I think we're sort of in that area right there. The Swan River, so this is 1842 to 1850, and you'll see badgers right here. And you're going to see the number of badgers they took, so 210, 175, 287 on that line. And then another neat line, I think, is the grizzlies down here. So grizzly large, so this is the number here, 37, 25, 25. The so grizzly bears were digging up a lot of soil. <laughs> they were good excavators. Um, Okay, so the Saskatchewan district um, is, again, we've got some badgers here, so 174, 350, 326, uh, 665 in the last, and then grizzly bear, so 90, 112, 79, 125, and so on. So pretty interesting, I think, and I think having baseline information is really important when we try and understand where we've, where we've been with some of these um, rare species. So, and then another, just, this is just for information, um, they, they recorded kit foxes, which were swift foxes, so they were reclassified as swift foxes, I don't really know the rationale behind that. So, um, if you look over, and, then, and these are records, like I can show you lots of records like this, so there were many thousands of swift fox. Um, on the prairies. So here we've got, you know, 1100, 1572, 1432. Um, those are tend to be higher, these three, but it's quite frequent. You'll see between um, three and 500 uh, per year. So prairie badgers, um, observations reported incidental to monitoring prairie dog populations. So the Calgary Zoo has a long-term systematic monitoring of prairie dogs in Grasslands National Park. And um, they've been monitoring them from 2012, 2012 to present. And each study plot has one to three remote cameras. 
And so incidental to monitoring for prairie dogs, they were photographing badgers. So we're collaborating with the, the Calgary Zoo and, and they have sorted and collated the data for us and then um, and provided us with, with these badger photos. And so it's been very interesting. Um, we are seeing a number of photos during the daytime and we're also seeing a number of photos during the winter, but not nearly as many as in the summer. But partly that's due to the um, batteries um, not being off. Difficult for us to know how active they are in the winter. Uh, so that's a question that if you have any information they, are, they would like to share, that would be uh, really helpful for us to know if they've seen much badger activity in the winter. Um, so here's a, another photograph of a, a badger in a prairie dog hole and uh, or in a den. I mean, sorry. Um, so. The, uh, the camera photos, they record the date and time. They have, we can identify the age class, so whether it's an adult or an offspring. Uh, document behavior, so if, they're, um, if they've captured any prey. We can sometimes see the sex as well, and especially like a lactating female. And we can sometimes identify individuals by their facial and dorsal, dorsal markings. And so this is something that we're just looking at in Calgary Zoo and I and others. We're just seeing whether it's possible to do that. And that, that's a, a value if you ever want to do like a mark and recapture study to estimate abundance, if, if there's a way to identify individuals. It can be really helpful for assessing population size and such. That's something people are interested in doing. But it's really preliminary. We don't see it. So this is a photo of um, a family of badgers in Lauder, Manitoba. And you can clearly see that there's two uh, on the right the lower two offspring have a distinct um, stripe down their face compared to the mother and, and the other offspring on the left. So really uncertain what's going on here, but it'd be interesting to figure it out. Um, so we also did snow track surveys uh, in uh, 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019. And I was hoping to do them longer term. Um, however, we we had to reprioritize some funding and, and um, species of special concern are, are sort of the lower level of funding. So unfortunately, we weren't able to continue with that last year. So with snow track surveys, we identify presence, absence, habitat use, and behavior. We can estimate trends in relative abundance if the track surveys are done long term. It's non-invasive, it's inexpensive, but it requires suitable snow conditions and expertise. Um, the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring has been doing snow track surveys for about 10 years, and now they're switching over to cameras. Parks Canada has also been doing um, snow track surveys. When I worked for Parks, um, I set up the trans track transects in Kootenai National Park. They were also used a lot in Banff National Park because of the twinning of the Trans-Canada Highway. So they could figure out where to put uh, wildlife underpasses. And Prince Albert National Park is also. So the study area was the south of the divide. And the pastures where we set up transects were Oberon Wise Creek, Beaver Valley, Dixon, and Val Marie. Also in Grasslands National Park and also NCC lands wide view. Uh, we were given permission to go to Old Man on his back, but we just weren't able to make it out there in those um, two winter seasons. So um, the track, the snow track surveys were done between um, pretty much sort of, I would say mid-December to the very end of March. And um, we would do three to four survey periods. Each survey period was about four days. And um, we did a, I did an initial assessment in 2016 to 2017 to look at snow conditions and that kind of thing. Uh, so we have to have established transects. Uh, so there's driving transects, so there's many kilometers. And then we have uh, foot transects, which are just checking my time to make sure I'm not going over here. Um, so each transect, so the foot transect, has three habitat types. Plateaus, ridge, and then valley bottom. And then in Grasslands National Park, we intersected the transects with the 
camera plots that they their long term um, camera monitoring camera plots. So it was uh, CWS field crew with uh, one contractor as well, and then um, and we were you know trained up for winter travel and we were equipped with emergency satellite transceivers. We followed the SOB research protocol and we had requested permission from land managers. So this is an example of driving transects and um, transects. So the red rectangulars uh, are the rectangles, are the foot transects. And we wanted to do like a circle so you don't need double paddle. And, um, and then the uh, dotted, the black and white um, hashed line is the driving transect. So we covered a lot of ground. Um, we covered a lot of ground. So, and it's very easy to see. Fortunate um, in some of these areas, we have little vehicle traffic. You're driving. You're doing, you know, say three kilometers an hour. It's easy to see the tracks. And so, and, and then if you have to, get, you know, you stop the vehicle over to the side, you, you need to identify the speed. It actually worked fairly well, pulled up traffic, uh, as far as I know. Um, and this is, I think this is um, the Balmarie. So again, uh, this was a really neat transect here. That was very interesting, getting um, down to the valley bottom there. And, uh, and then in this area, we actually um, had a, a stage growth lighting. So that was pretty cool. <coughs> so these are the forms that we would fill out. So we would cover um, everything from you know date and time to species, and then it became clear to me that I we needed to to roughly estimate um, prey track. And so these were just very coarse estimates. Um, So the findings, um, unfortunately, we had no evidence of fresh badger tracks. And uh, we did locate inactive badger burrows, but no evidence of fresh badger tracks. And it's tough to say with 100% certainty that you have a badger burrow that's active if you don't see tracks. Uh, prey abundance was very low. so. I do a lot of, I did a lot of work in the mountain parks. Uh, I've also been up north in northern Saskatchewan. So relative to those areas, prey abundance was extremely low and, and I, was, I was really surprised by it. Uh, what was neat was the ground squirrel activity along the gravel roads in March. So it seemed to be that's where the ground squirrels came up first. And I'm saying that with a big question mark. Uh, but that has an case. The um, if the badgers, when they're rearing their offspring um, in March and April, if they may go to these areas where there's early ground squirrel activity, and that would make them vulnerable, possibly being hit by vehicles. So we actually saw more evidence of yes, the greater stage growth. We we actually quite remarkable. There was a, a lack. Uh, they were active growth on one of our transects, that, and that lack hadn't been reported for years. And then uh, we saw stage growth that looked well. And uh, and then we just saw incidental to to the transects, so that they weren't part of the survey. But um, so. Uh, Perry Badger Snow Tracking Survey, these are actually uh, uh, rabbit tracks that are crystallized. And um, so I had some doubt or concerns about whether we would be able to do track transects in um, a scary environment where you've got high sun and wind exposure. But actually, I think it works, and I did some adjustments for it. And so um, one of the things is in the mountain parts, a time fall and in this situation you probably need to go time since um, snowfall or uh, wind you have to keep track of uh, the wind 
And but the advantage of that is we got a frequent redistribution of snow by the wind, and we have extremely long flight lines, which you won't get in other places. So that's really um, advantageous for me. Okay. Um, track so preliminary insights and questions. So based on what I observed, I wonder uh, if the badger density is actually very low in this study area, and or I wonder are badgers less active in winter, so the cold temperatures and that kind of thing. Do they have longer bouts of torpor? Uh, is winter prey density here or it's small carnivores? So, you know, whether it's swift fox or badgers, is there enough for them to eat? And back in the 1800s, when there was thousands of swift fox, I wonder what, you know, if they were, or were. So, whether they were scavenging bison, that's, you know, you could speculate about it. Um, not sure. So, effects of drought conditions on small mammals, uh, I, I that's something we would should be looked at. And then uh, and then the spring emergence of ground squirrels along the road. We have to we're, we're gonna be preparing the Sarah management plan for this subspecies. Uh, and um, GWS Prairie Region is the lead. We have our funding has been is to this species now, so we're a little bit that way. Um, the timeline has been pushed back because of working on the grizzly bear file and also because of COVID-19. Um, next steps will be compiling, sorting, examining, and communicating the existing data. And potential next steps would be looking at local knowledge, indigenous and science observations, and possibly partnering with other research So the COSIMIC status report identified these threats by this subspecies, human-caused mortality, hunting and trapping, incidental poisoning for rodenticide. So Gilbert, Prue, and Mackenzie uh, examined uh, a couple of they have a couple of studies, and so they reported that uh, badgers in southwest Saskatchewan died less than nine days of consuming Richardson ground squirrel that were exposed to chlorofacinone, and that badgers um, in areas with 20% rodenticide application were 2.2 times higher in density than, than the number of badgers in an area with 80% uh, rodenticide application. And then the other concern is vehicle collisions. Vehicle collisions are well documented in um, southern BC and southern Ontario. And then habitat loss, so, so cultivation. So, that, so badgers apparently, from other reports in the US and, and um, southern Ontario and BC, avoid cultivated areas. So the additional threats that, that uh, I think should be considered for this subspecies on the prairies is the effects of drought climate on plant growth and prey abundance. So burrowing mammals are uh, seen as pests and owned by some. Uh, they leave holes in the ground, they create surface uh, mounds. Uh, there's concerns around damage to machinery, concerns about injuries to livestock. Um, a survey done with BC ranchers found uh, no evidence of, of damage to livestock. Of 48 respondents, 47% considered badgers beneficial and 21% considered them detrimental. Uh, you know, it is worth noting that, you know, bison, deer, elk, and moose coexist with burrowing mammals, burrowing mammals without apparent significant effects. Um, the benefits of burrowing mammals in grasslands is um, they aerate the soil, they aerate and mix the soil, they fertilize, they introduce organic matter into the uh, subterranean tunnels. Um, the surface holes in subterranean tunnels trap and retain precipitation and snow melt and they increase soil moisture. And, um, and I think 
you know, there have, you know, Eldridge has, has reported this in, in um, you know, two, well, one, anyways, American Midland Natural Peer Review Journals. But I think it's also, you know, it's just common sense that we just can, we can appreciate that that's, um, you know, that's what they're doing and it's, that the soil quality and, and moisture can affect plant growth as well. So, um, yeah, we'll go. And that concludes the presentation for today. And I welcome any questions or suggestions. Thank you, Diana. Thanks for sharing all the information that you know and, and rather, I guess, don't know about Badgers. It was really, really interesting. Uh, we do have a couple questions from listeners on the line, and I'm going to um, unmute the East End group. So if they have questions there too, they can chime in as well. Um, our first question is from a listener named Jeff, and he's wondering if um, do you have metrics on sufficient cover in agricultural fields? Didn't quite capture that, Caitlin. Sorry. Sorry, we missed had a little bit of feedback. Do you have metrics on sufficient cover in agricultural fields? No, we don't have no. metrics on okay, that. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> no I mean, problem. I think it's probably a um, and then, looked at. Okay. Um, and the same listener would like to know if agricultural crops, like annual cropping, um, include tame grass. Do you have any information about it? What was the what, what's the question related to the um, tame grass? Um, yeah, when you say agricultural like, crops, do you mean tame grass or um, like rotational cropping? Do you have a definition of what you mean by that? When they use agricultural areas, I think it's used more loosely for southern Ontario and southern BC, so they don't distinguish so much between so so. So pastures are fine, whether it's, so grass is fine, it's good for badgers. So these are tilled fields that they're avoiding. So no grass. Okay. Okay, thank you for clarifying okay. that. Um, a, list, a listener named Troy would like to know, um, is there a timeline for producing the SARA management plan? There is a timeline. It, it's due that it's supposed to be um, published. I think it's February 2021. So we have three years from the time it's listed under SARA. So the Badger okay. management plan should have been completed by February 2021, but that will not be. We will not. We will not be meeting that timeline. Okay. Um, there's a listener named Carolyn, um, and she's wondering, uh, or you, she said that you mentioned trapping as a threat, and she's wondering, is it legal to trap badgers, or is it an incidental catch? That's the issue. It, um, my oh, you caught me on a good, I, I think you can trap and hunt year round. Okay. Because there are species of special not, concern and not listed. Yeah. Okay. That's, I have to check that's okay. the regulations. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a listener named Sonia that asks, are there any recommendations for effective setback distances if an, effect, if an active den is found for agricultural equipment or industrial work? Um, so a different work unit within Environment Climate Change Canada, I believe they have a setback distance for Badger, but so I would have to get that. So you're more than welcome to email me and I can get that for you. And I also okay. believe that okay. provincially they might also have some as well. Okay. Thanks for that answer. I'm just going to check in with um, Tom and Krista and East End and see if they have any questions there. Um, Tom or Krista, can you hear me? Uh, any questions from the board? Oh. 
I always wondered about the measures uh, in, in terms of their eating habits with uh, Richards and Grouse squirrels. Uh, have you any idea how many they capture on the surface, or do they have to dig a hole and uh, dig out the door every time they want lunch? Um, Diana, did you hear, did you hear that, that question, or would you like me to repeat it? Can you repeat it? Um, yeah, so I believe the question is, um, if you know how many Richardson ground squirrels um, that they're eating, and do they have to dig dig it out, or, or their method of hunting? She answered the question. Sorry, Diana, I, I think I might have muted you by accident. Did you have a chance to answer? Or would you be so able I to So I heard the question was, yeah, how many ground, how many Richard and ground squirrels do they consume? And again, I don't have that number, but I, Yale Michener would, would have done that. She would have that kind of stat, so I'd be happy, if somebody wants to email me, I'd be happy to provide that information. And then, um, and then the other question is, how do they capture them? They dig them out of the ground. Um, they dig, I actually haven't seen it. I haven't seen, I've seen the, the prey in their mouth. So they uh, can either dig them out of their ground or possibly they can run after them and capture them above ground. Okay, so you think know. that they're more chasing them compared to digging? No, I think that, no, I think they, no, mostly they're digging, but, um, but I've seen them run in the, in the, so mostly it's digging, digging them out of the ground, and mostly it's actually hibernating a Richardson ground squirrel. So when they were killing them in um, October to November, the ground squirrels were in hibernation mode, so they're very vulnerable. So those were being dug out. Um, so I would say I'm gonna, you know, usually they're being dug out, but I have seen a few photos of. Um, of a badger running like towards a <laughs> towards a uh, a mound, a prairie dog mound. So, but usually it's digging and hibernating animals. That interesting. Are yeah. Wow, so interesting. Um, in the sense, did that answer the question, or do you have any more? Uh, Don, Don's got a thumbs up, so all good. Any other questions from the board? No, it doesn't sound like it. So thanks very much there, Diana. You're welcome. Yes, and some of our listeners have typed in um, that this was a great presentation, um, arguably the most interesting prairie species, and I agree with that. So um, thank you again, Diana, for joining the SODCAP AGM today and um, sharing your all of your knowledge about badger. So thank you. and. Um, Dana, you're welcome to stay on the line or I know you're, you're really busy. <laughs> um, feel free to, to leave if you need to.